So uh, the topic of this uh, webinar is uh, immersive and interactive virtual reality experience of history and Skrube, the legacy. So I will briefly uh, uh, give a quick overview. So first of all, it was a joint project between, or it is still a joint project between Fraunhofer HHI, Fraunhofer Heinrich Herz Institute here in Berlin, the institute where I'm heading a research group on immersive media and communication. And together with UFA, the famous German media production company, and uh, with uh, support by Volucap, which is the company which uh, uses our technology and runs an own uh, commercial volumetric video studio. So first, uh, the outline of my presentation. Uh, at the beginning, I will uh, give a little bit of motivation uh, how we uh, ended up with this project, how we uh, came to this idea and the different challenges and so on. And then I will go into more detail in the topic on volumetric video production. So you get um, more detailed information how we create these novel type of uh, volumetric uh, 3D data. Uh, then I will talk a little bit about the storyboard, uh, how we developed uh, the story, the challenges and uh, the first uh, approaches, how to create a novel type of uh, virtual reality experience. And finally, I will present some preliminary results. So about the motivation. Um, XR stands for extended reality and uh, it offers a new ways of media consumption. So there is uh, a plenty of uh, application domains and areas where extended reality, which means uh, virtual reality, augmented reality or mixed reality applications uh, are quite useful. The uh, benefit or the possibility is that with this kind of technology we can uh, enter completely new spaces. We can uh, virtually fly, we can dive in the ocean, uh, but we can also do a lot of uh, useful things which cannot or hardly be done in, in reality, like we can do virtual operations, we can uh, train uh, rescue situations uh, which would be harmful in reality. Uh, we can repeat all these exercises many times as often as we want. So this is a pretty new uh, uh, possibility and uh, a an, uh, huge amount of uh, uh, new application domains, applications are uh, possible and are already out there. So the, especially for virtual reality, where we see a completely virtual environment with our virtual reality glasses like uh, HTC Vive or Oculus Rift, for example, we are fully immersed. We are completely in this uh, virtual environment. We enter a completely new space and uh, depending on the quality of the experience, we can create really authentic experiences. We can go to places where we never would uh, be able to go, for example, on top of Mount Everest or on other historical sites. So it offers a lot of possibilities and even more, we can also archive memories so we can uh, in terms of uh, cultural heritage, we can create experiences which allow us to uh, bring history alive and uh, preserve uh, memories. And this is even more important if we think about the young generation. So uh, historical moments in, uh, in our past can be kept alive for the young generation. And uh, so therefore uh, it helps uh, 
the young generation to understand what was going on, what are the lessons learned from the past, and how should this <laughs> influence uh, our future. Um, a very important aspect is that there are special persons uh, which represent parts of the history. And if you talk about uh, the German history, um, these are obvious uh, the uh, survivors of the Holocaust. And uh, so the idea is to keep them alive and uh, keep them for the next generations and uh, preserve their stories, preserve their uh, emotions and their expressions and keep them alive uh, for the future. The question is, uh, if we talk about a application, a virtual reality application, how to present this real persons, which we know, for example, Ernst Gruber, how can we present them realistically, realistically in computer graphics uh, environment, in CGI? So, how can we create digital uh, representations which look uh, as photorealistic as possible and uh, as convincing as possible? And uh, you can imagine the solution is volumetric video. So this was uh, the motivation how we ended up uh, for this uh, kind of uh, project. And now I will give you a little bit more insight about uh, uh, what volumetric video is. So uh, if we ask, uh, uh, try to find an answer on this question, uh, first we need to look uh, how uh, the representation of humans uh, has been done so far, especially if we look at the motion picture industry uh, at, uh, to Hollywood, for example. Uh, their persons are currently represented as animated characters. So there is a, a 3D model which is created in the computer. It's a fairly realistic 3D model of a human being, of a person. And uh, then this uh, model, this computer model, will then be animated. And to get some realistic animations, uh, motion of real actors are captured. And then this captured motion is uh, transferred onto the model. And the model does the same motion as has been captured by real actors. So this is the way how, um, yeah, computer-generated uh, humans are animated and become alive. So the issue with this approach is that uh, there is a limited complexity of motion which can be tracked. So with these uh, currently available motion capture um, systems, you can uh, almost capture um, body motion, but uh, if we look more into facial expressions and, and so on, then it becomes uh, difficult. Uh, furthermore, if uh, we uh, look at uh, clothes, for example, um, the folds of the clothes, the moving of the shirt and so on, is also quite difficult to uh, motion to model and to animate. So therefore, there are some limitations if we fully create an artificial avatar and animate this avatar. So therefore, our idea is uh, to capture the actor or the person directly and create from the video information which uh, has been captured a 3D model. So if we capture a person, then we can create per frame a 3D model and if we render the different uh, 3D models uh, along the time, then we get the dynamics of the 3D model and the representation of this person. So with this approach, we can 
capture everything. We can capture the body movement, we can capture the facial expression, the motion of clothes, everything is captured. And we have then finally our dynamic 3D model. And the usual representation of such a dynamic 3D model is a sequence of meshes. So, uh, and the advantage of this uh, is that if we integrate such a, a 3D model in a virtual environment, we're able to look around, to watch uh, this uh, person from any direction, and uh, we can walk around and uh, have uh, really uh, convincing and immersive uh, feeling of presence. So how is this done in uh, practice? So to get uh, the right capture setup, we designed almost three years ago a 360 degree volumetric uh, capture studio. And in comparison to other commercial studios uh, in the world, we follow a different approach, which uh, uh, consists of um, integrated uh, uh, background with integrated lighting. So we have uh, light panels in the back of uh, a transparent or diffuse uh, tissue. And the person inside the rotunda is lit from any direction. This has some advantages concerning uh, uh, video processing. And uh, the main reason is that we can fully avoid uh, green screen uh, um, capture technologies. In this rotunda, we mounted uh, 32 cameras. And these 32 cameras are arranged in stereo pairs. So we have overall 16 stereo pairs. And on the right hand side, you see uh, the different perspectives. So we have uh, uh, four um, pairs from top, uh, eight pairs from the center, and four pairs again from the bottom. And the person inside is captured, therefore, from any direction. And this video information is then used for our next uh, processing steps. Another difference compared to other commercial uh, volumetric capture studios is that we use high resolution cameras. So we use 20 megapixel cameras instead of HD or 4K cameras, which are used currently in other studios. And uh, so therefore we have uh, really high quality uh, cameras available. So the best possible input data for our workflow. This is uh, then our full end-to-end -end automatic uh, production workflow. So if we start on the top uh, uh, left, we receive all the 16, uh, all the 32 video streams from the 32 cameras. By the way, uh, the captured raw data of our capture system is round about 1.6 terabyte per minute of video. So this is a huge amount of raw data. And you will see then later on uh, the challenge how to reduce this huge amount of data to get a final data format which has uh, an still high quality in texture and high level of detail in geometry but with a far much more reduced uh, data rate. So this uh, original data are first uh, processed in a, a color and color adaption and grading module where we equalize all the cameras. Then we do the segmentation. We segment the object from the background because we just want to reconstruct the person itself and not the background. And then our depth estimation comes into play. So for all the 16 stereo pairs, we perform a depth estimation using uh, our patented uh, depth estimation approach. The result is that each of the 16 uh, stereo pairs provides a uh, yeah, 3D information from 
the uh, specific perspective. This 3D information is then fused in a fusion step and we end up with uh, finally a 3D point cloud representing the person in 3D. And all these processing steps are per frame uh, processing steps. So we have per frame a single 3D point cloud and usually after this processing step, we end up with uh, several millions of 3D points. Perhaps you know, but uh, 3D points are not the best possible data format to be used for real-time rendering in uh, real-time render engines like Unity. Uh, so therefore, uh, this uh, 3D point cloud needs to be converted in a mesh, which is, uh, um, uh, so each, all of the 3D points are connected via, uh, so we end up with a, a mesh of triangles and uh, this is then a representation which describes not only the 3D shape of the object, but also the surface of the object. This mesh after uh, this process is still quite huge. So, uh, and it's far too, far too detailed, which cannot uh, render it an, on any render engine. So therefore, we need to reduce the mesh. And this is done in the mesh reduction step. And uh, there we um, merge meshes which uh, describe the same surface. And in detailed regions, so regions where we have uh, um, quite high uh, geometrical detail, we keep the mesh resolution high. But overall, the Reduced mesh has uh, much uh, less uh, complexity compared to the original mesh and even um, much less data compared to the um, original input uh, video information. So um, in practice, this uh, resulting uh, mesh or the sequence of meshes uh, is round about 500 to 800 megabyte per minute of uh, mesh sequence. So compared to the 1.6 terabyte, this is a tremendous reduction of complexity. But if you look at the results later on, you will see that uh, we kept the texture detail and we capture, kept the um, geometrical resolution and the geometrical detail. Uh, and this is the challenge in the whole workflow. This sequence of meshes is still not an appropriate uh, um, data format because there are several applications where we wish to transmit this uh, new, fo new format, this volumetric video. So we want to transmit it via uh, internet, we want to stream it to some other application and so on. So therefore, we uh, developed a mesh encoding uh, scheme and uh, developed a complete uh, volumetric video encoder, which encodes not only the mesh, but also the texture information and the audio information. And this all is packed in, a, in an MP4 stream and this is then streamed to the receiving application. And this is then finally an augmented reality or virtual reality application. And on the receiving side, we need the uh, respective uh, decoding module to decode all the stream, uh, all the data from the volumetric video stream. And this, uh, um, uh, data are then rendered in the real-time render, render engine like Unity, for example. In the next uh, slide here, you see some examples of uh, our processing steps. So the one specific challenge in this production was that we captured uh, two persons at the same time. Usually we capture only a single person 
but uh, due to this uh, setup, it is a kind of interview situ situation where Ernst Gruber on the right hand side um, uh, talks with a young student. Uh, they had to capture, had to be captured uh, at the same time to, um, yeah, to show the interaction between both of them. So on the left hand side, you see a single depth map uh, from one of the stereo pairs and the color code uh, describes the depth of the 3D points uh, in the scene. If we go further in our workflow, we then uh, see the point cloud in the second uh, uh, image, in the second figure. So this is the result after fusion of all the depth maps from all the 16 stereo pairs. And this point cloud needs then to be meshed and uh, the next uh, image shows the meshed point cloud. This is still the high complexity mesh, uh, which needs then to be reduced. So then you see in the next uh, figure, the reduced mesh. And finally, we do the texturing. So we project the uh, come the colors, color information from the original images onto the 3D model to have uh, the correct uh, texture on the 3D objects. So this is more the technical part. Uh, now I would like to talk a little bit about the storyboard. So I said, uh, um, Preserving uh, important persons of the history for the future is uh, quite an important uh, task and uh, quite an important uh, uh, project. So uh, therefore, especially in, in view of uh, cult preserving cultural heritage. So therefore, uh, we asked uh, a friend of my father, uh, which is Ernst Gruber. He's one of the last uh, German survivors of the Holocaust. He lives uh, in, actually in Regensburg in Germany. And we asked him if he is willing to uh, do this uh, pilot uh, production with us. And he was quite interested. He is uh, very, uh, was very excited about this project. And he's, although he's, um, mm, more than 80 years old, he is uh, quite uh, keen on new technologies. So uh, we started the project with him. Uh, then we asked a young student because uh, we thought uh, there must be a, a young person in the scene to get the link to the young audience to uh, um, to. Uh, make it easier for the younger audience to be aware of about this uh, situation. And uh, therefore, we asked uh, a young student to act as an uh, interviewer. Then we developed uh, a storyboard. We had uh, uh, several meetings with Ernst Gruber. We talked about his uh, um, experiences during the Holocaust, uh, during Nazi regime. And we try to identify several interesting or key uh, parts of of his uh, of, of of this period of life. Uh, so therefore, we decided finally for six uh, different topics. So we captured six interviews, which last each about eight to twelve minutes. And in these interviews, we cover different topics like the exclusion of the Jewish population by the Nazi regime, the Jewish life in Nazi Germany, and Gruber's life in the ghetto in Munich, uh, the deportation, uh, also the concentration camp in Theresienstadt where he spent uh, some months, and finally one interview is about his life uh, in Germany after the Second World War. So we would not only talk about this uh, dark period, we also wanted to talk about the 
quite a challenging phase after the Second World War. So if we think about how to create this uh, virtual reality experience, uh, there are several challenges. So first of all, uh, the question is how to recreate historical sites in, in CGI in, in a virtual environment, how to build uh, appealing and realistic models. Um, another question is how can we mix some computer generated models with uh, historical material, with uh, imagery, with uh, videos and so on. Uh, for some locations which uh, showed up in this interviews by Ernst Grube, uh, some of these locations did not exist anymore because they were destroyed during the Second World War. So how to recreate these uh, past locations. And finally, we just, we not wanted only to, um, to keep the, the, the viewer or the user of the virtual reality experience as a passive uh, user, but we want to invite him to also interact with this uh, virtual reality experience, with the content in this VR experience. So these were several challenges we had to face with because we wanted to create a, or we want to create a VR experience which can be, for example, used, be used in, in memorial sites, uh, in schools for educational purposes and so on. So therefore, this VR experience needs to be convincing, uh, appealing and attractive and uh, uh, bring some benefit for the user. So what was our approach? Yeah, first of all, we need to do some historical research. We need to uh, check uh, for historical material. We asked Hans Gruber about uh, photographs and so on. And we did some research in uh, libraries and so on. And also in the internet, we looked for historical video material, which could be used for this VR experience. Then, the first, very first step was to create a concept art. So we need to have a rough idea how this virtual environment could look like. So what uh, is the outlook of uh, the different uh, sceneries which uh, where uh, Ernst Gruber is talking about. And then as we want to show not only a single event in the history of, of Ernst Grube, but we want to uh, present uh, several important milestones uh, of his life, uh, ranging from 19, uh, um, 1938 to 1952, for example. We were thinking about how to develop uh, a VR experience where you can uh, experience the, uh, the, the timeline, how you can uh, experience different points in time uh, in this VR experience. And therefore we uh, came up with the idea to create uh, a walk, a uh, walkway and uh, to let the user walk along the timeline and experience the different uh, points in time together with Hans Gruber. With respect to interaction, we uh, came up with the idea to uh, model some stale, uh, which uh, are standing nearby the path uh, in the VR environment. And at these uh, stale, you can then select via interactive uh, technologies by using the controller, for example, and choose uh, some additional information. So you can get more information about this dedicated period in time. You can get uh, more uh, image or video information and so on. So this is uh, about the interactive part. So 
uh, after all these uh, thinkings and the design of the virtual reality experience and so on, we uh, came up with uh, uh, first sketches. So this is uh, a rough uh, sketch of the timeline. So you can see the path and uh, the different uh, places uh, which uh, are um, related to different points in time. So the first episode about the apartment in Munich, the second episode in the children's home in, uh, in Munich, and the third episode, for example, the deportation. So this is just for the first three episodes. Uh, the other three are uh, coming soon. And you also see uh, how we integrated additional material in this virtual environment. So we installed screens for archive material and we put this interactive stale along the pathway where the user can interact and get additional information. So these are some first concepts, uh, arts uh, of uh, different episodes. So on the left-hand side, you see a sketch uh, drawing of the apartment in Munich. And on the right hand side, you see a drawing of uh, the children's home. So these are the very first steps uh, for a uh, computer graphics uh, modeler and designer, uh, how to start with the modeling. Uh, here are some other concept art with uh, which uh, shows the freight yard, the deportation camp, and the main gate of uh, Theresienstadt on the right-hand side. This is uh, um, uh, some images from our shooting. So we did the shooting in the Volucap studio in Potsdam, Babelsberg in Germany. And this was uh, almost one year ago in August 2019. On the right hand side, on top, you see Hans Grube and the young student uh, in the uh, capture stage, on the capture, capture stage, and uh, you see also the, some of the cameras which are mounted in the wall, arranged as stereo pairs. And on the bottom, you see the whole uh, production team. In the center, Hans Grube and his wife, uh, Helga. And uh, all the crew from uh, the capture system, uh, the uh, production team, and so on. And uh, as already said, we captured uh, six interviews. So in total, around about 50 minutes of uh, material. And uh, this is uh, currently around about 90 terabytes of raw data which we have on our uh, data server. And all these data are waiting to be pro processed. On the left-hand side, you see uh, again this real image from uh, uh, both uh, actors uh, uh, in the studio. And on the right-hand side, you see already uh, a result of our reconstruction. So. Uh, this is not uh, an image from uh, the real persons. It's an image of the 3D models, which we created from the video data. And you can see how detailed uh, the texture is, how detailed the, the geometry is, and so on. But it's even more interesting how the 3D model looks if it's uh, moving. And in the next... Uh, slide you will see a very short uh, uh, demo video uh, of our volumetric asset of uh, Ernst Grube and the young student. So we can look around the 3D models at any desired position. We can observe them from the back, from top, and uh, all the motion and expression is captured 
the enthusiasm of Ernst Gruber, how he explains uh, how, uh, yeah, when he was talking about his uh, experience, his experiences in the past. So, and this is the uh, first result uh, of the um, 3D virtual environment and uh, Ernst Gruber and the young student are already integrated in this 3D environment. So this is a screenshot of the uh, scene which, is, uh, which has been developed so far. Uh, we get a little bit closer. So you can see how Hans Gruber and uh, the young student are standing in the children's, in the garden of the children's home and Hans Gruber is uh, talking about his experience in the children's home uh, and uh, yeah, explains what he uh, experienced. And here is another view. Yes, as you might have noticed, we have a lot of uh, data available, so 90 terabytes uh, at the moment, and uh, the production of such a complex virtual environment is quite uh, time consuming and costly. So therefore, we started uh, with the first proof of concept. So we selected this uh, second episode and Scrooge in the children's home and uh, created a proof of concept of three minutes to demonstrate the capability of uh, virtual reality to, to the uh, topic or the area of uh, cultural heritage, how to preserve uh, history for the next generation. This uh, proof of concept is close to be finished. So uh, we, there are still some uh, things to be finalized before we go public with the first proof of concept. So the plan is to launch the first proof of concept, the uh, complete VR experience for the second episode by end of September, so in a few weeks. And the uh, idea is to present this production then to, uh, for example, to the visitor center of the memorial site in Sachsenhausen, which is a quite famous uh, memorial site uh, of a former concentration camp in, in Germany, in, in the north of Berlin. And we are also in contact with a secondary school in Berlin and we want to evaluate uh, how the pupils experience the story of Ernst Gruber, for example, during their history lessons. And we want to uh, yeah, evaluate and test this uh, new concept of interactive story storytelling for education. For sure, the plan is to create the full uh, volumetric video experience or virtual reality experience with all the six uh, interviews, all the six episodes. But uh, for this, uh, we need uh, still some funding. Uh, we are already in discussion and we are convinced that as soon as we go public with this first proof of concept, we will find some sponsor to develop uh, the missing five uh, episodes. So let's uh, summarize. Um, I guess, um, I hope I have uh, uh, demonstrated very well that uh, extended reality and especially virtual reality is an ideal technology to archive uh, people's memories. And therefore this kind of uh, um, application or this kind of uh, uh, virtual reality experience can also be considered as a highly relevant cult, uh, contribution to preserve uh, the cultural heritage. Uh, furthermore, uh, to create this immersive uh, experience that you really 
be in the scene and uh, experience the the persons as uh, real uh, living persons you need to have uh, the relevant technology and uh, and the right technology and as our examples shown uh, volumetric video is the right technology to preserve uh, historic persons especially in this context of uh, uh, vr experience in cultural heritage you need to be careful how to design uh, such uh, VR environments, how to tell the story, how to tell the story, and even more if we talk about dark periods of history like the Holocaust. Another important aspect is that we need to have a good balance between education but also entertainment. We want to attract uh, the younger generation to experience this uh, uh, VR uh, application and uh, we want to uh, yeah, influence them and give them some important message for their own behavior for the future. So uh, therefore it's uh, heavily important to uh, do an evaluation to check and to test how this uh, uh, new type of concept is accepted and how it is supports how it supports uh, the education needs and uh, to further improve uh, the overall interactive concept and to create a more appealing and much more convincing immersive uh, virtual reality experiences. Yeah, this uh, summarizes my talk. Um, however, I'm not only heading a research group at Fraunhofer HHI, but I'm also coordinator of a European research project, which is called XR for All, Extended Reality for All. It's a coordination and support action. And for those of you who are active in the extended reality community, I kindly invite you to become a member of uh, XR for All. So the mission of uh, our project is uh, to establish a pan-European XR community to foster collaboration, uh, to accelerate the growth of European XR technology industry, to facilitate technology transfer from research to market, and uh, to develop a concrete research agenda for the coming future. And we also provide uh, financial support. So there is a budget of 1.5 million available, which we offer to research teams to develop new solutions in immersive interactive technologies. Uh, the, this uh, is one of the leading projects in uh, the area of uh, interactive technologies and we want to continue this effort in the future and the final goal is to uh, end up with a new umbrella organization which unifies all the activities around extended reality in Europe. So therefore, if you are active in this area, look at our website and join our community. With this final remark on the H2020 project XR for All, I conclude my talk. I thanks a lot to all the contributors. First of all, Hans Grube and uh, his wife Helga Hanusa. Phil Carstensen was the young student. And then uh, there was a large team of UFA colleagues involved, Frank Goval, Philip Guiz, Simon Purk, Alpay Alguer, and Ernst Feiler. And uh, on the volumetric video side, uh, I have, uh, we have our strong team uh, from Fraunhofer HHI, from our research group, which are Ingo Feldmann, Auri Lascheu, Markus Borchel, Sylvain Renault, Markus Zepp, and Dekai Chen. And we got support by Philip Wenning from InVR Space and the colleagues from VolueCap, Sven Bliedung, Thomas Ebner, and Steffen Günther. So this is a large crew, and thanks to all of them, 
to uh, make this uh, production happen. And thank you all for listening my talk and now I'm open for questions.